Good morning, my friends. Welcome again to Believer's Fellowship, a time of study in God's Word. And so I encourage you, if you have the means to join us in your Bible, in an app, whatever you may have, I believe it will be of great help to you. Because I have something on my heart that has been developing over the last few days, and I'm going to be sharing about that today. And I really believe it's going to help many of you today. Over the last couple days, I've had uh, the privilege of speaking with a couple of individuals separate from knowing each other in circumstances, and yet both going through similar situations. And in general, what the problem was they were having and seeking counsel about was that they were dealing with family and friends who were being brainwashed by the new cancel culture the new woke mentality that has brought into question everything from what a biblical marriage is in God's eyes, <clears throat> the issues of abortion, and the many other things that are happening so rapidly in our government and in our culture. And one of the problems that they expressed is that as they do their best to stand for righteousness, that which they have known and learned since a child, have been taught well, has served them well as the biblical guidelines for their own life, then they're finding resistance and even conflict and animosity. And the word that often came up was, well, why aren't you a peacemaker? Why can't you just let there be peace? Why do you always have to stir things up and, and cause turmoil? And I want to deal with that, with that subject today because perhaps we can begin with the words of Jesus. It's what they're referring to in Matthew chapter 5 when he makes the statement that blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. So I want to talk to you about what he meant. In fact, the title of the message today is, What Does It Really Mean? to be a peacemaker? We're going to try and answer that question according to God's Word. The frustration these individuals had is understandable because nobody wants to create conflict. We would all like to believe that we are doing our best to be peacemakers. But I'm going to show you that perhaps we've not purposely or practically understood what Jesus meant by being a peacemaker. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to write something down. I'm going to show you the difference between what Jesus called a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Because there's a vast difference between the two, and yet often we confuse them as one and the same. What I'm going to show you through God's Word is that we have in many cases a complete upside-down concept of what it means to be a peacemaker. What does it really mean to be one who makes peace? Well, let's compare it to a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper is someone, and we've often heard this phrase that, well, I just want to keep the peace. I want to keep the peace. And what they mean by that is, I, I don't want to stir things up. I don't want to uh, create an argument or uh, tension in the room or among my family members. So therefore, I'm going to do little, if anything. I'm going to refrain from saying certain things. I'm going to avoid, and a better word would be compromise, the truth for the sake of keeping the peace. And that makes you a peacekeeper. However, the word that Jesus used is far different. Someone is a, who's a peacemaker is not only not committed to silence or uh, avoiding controversy, but it's someone who understands that, listen carefully, because it's key to everything that Jesus meant. True peace, he says throughout the New Testament, is first and foremost peace with God. Because you see, if we don't have peace with God, you can't have peace with anybody. You can't have peace in your own heart. And so we have to understand that a true peacemaker is one who has made peace 
with their God. We often talk about someone who is passing away or may just have, and we pray that they made peace with God before they did. And so we understand making peace with God is when we come to an understanding that we've all been born in sin, Romans 3, 23, and that we need a savior. And because we are sinners, we are at enmity, James says, with God, hostile towards. Actually, the Bible says we become his enemies. And the true definition of a peacemaker, right out of the dictionary, is one who removes the barriers between two hostile parties. I want to say that again. A peacemaker, by definition, is one who will remove the barriers between two hostile parties. Now you say, well, Brother West, that's what I, I'm trying to do. By removing anything controversial or uh, not bringing up certain subjects, uh, uh, avoiding certain things that today go contrary to what's very popular in the woke culture, I'm trying to remove that barrier so the hostility will not take place. That's not what he's talking about. Again, we're talking about first and foremost, peace with God. And the only thing that is a barrier between us and God is our sin. The Bible makes that very clear. Jeremiah said, it is our sins that have separated us from God. And however, that barrier of sin can be removed when we come to understand the message of the cross, what Jesus did for us on Calvary, and when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for us, place our faith and our trust and surrender our lives to him, we have now removed the barrier between two hostile parties. And in doing so, we become peacemakers. So whenever you bring someone to Christ, whenever you're able to counsel someone who's going through difficulty, and you can bring them to an understanding that if they are without Christ, if they've not surrendered their life to him, then there's going to be no peace in their life. The Bible says there is no peace for the wicked. Jeremiah prophesied that. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some deeper things relative to what it means to be one who makes peace by removing any barrier between an individual or yourself and God so that we can truly be and understand what it means to really be a peacemaker. You know, I'm going to make a statement that you don't often hear talked about, but then I'm going to back it up by the very words of Jesus. That many times Jesus didn't come to bring peace and unity, but he actually said part of his purpose was to bring division. I call it divine division. You say, what is that, Brother West? Well, if you have a Bible, in Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read you the words of Jesus himself. When he says in verse 40, he said, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it already be kindled? Now, I want you to remember that because when we close, I'm going to go back to this key here as to what Jesus meant by him sending fire on the earth. Now, he's going to go on and explain in some detail, but there's a real key to this fire. So I want you to just jot that in your notes. Put a question mark next to the word fire. What did Jesus mean? When he said, I have come to send fire on the earth. Well, he goes on to say, suppose you that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, no, but rather division. I want that just to sink in for a minute. These are the words of Jesus himself, where he said, I've come to send fire on earth. We're going to understand that better in a minute. But he said that fire he said, is not going to bring peace. He said, I suppose you think that's why I've come? He said, no, but rather division. Now, this is not the kind of division that uh, angrily separates friends or family members, but it is, in fact, a divine division that is absolutely critical and necessary if we're going to see the glory of God return to the church as it did in the early days when Christianity began, the miracles and power they had then was literally because of a divine division. So let's listen to these words again, and I'm going to read on. Jesus said, I've come to send fire on the earth, 
And he said, it's already kindled. Suppose you that I've come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, no, but rather division. For, next verse, for from henceforth there shall be five in one household divided, three against two and two against three. Verse 53, the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father and the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now we need to understand what Jesus is saying here. Again, you don't hear this preached very often because it sounds somewhat contradictory. Didn't the angels proclaim in Bethlehem that a Savior was being born and therefore there would be peace on earth? But I remind you also that Jesus said in the book of John, he said that I've come to give you peace, but it's not peace like the world gives. So whenever we read peace, we need to understand what kind of peace he's talking about. Because we're going to understand in just a moment that there's a very dangerous false peace that is on the horizon. A one world order that's going to bring about what most of the world will consider to be wonderful peace. Harmony, the end of war, a new move of morality. And yet, my friends, the Bible is very clear that this will be orchestrated by an Antichrist. Already the groundwork's being laid by the spirit of Antichrist that has moved through many individuals and is increasing even as we speak. And so listen to what he said. He said, I haven't come just to bring families together because in many cases they won't be. They're going to be divided. How so? Well, certainly and first and foremost, when one accepts Christ as they did in those days and others believe that he was not who he said he was, did not believe in Jesus, then there was automatically a division. And the only way to resolve that division would be to compromise the truth. Now we're going to get at the key here to the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. You see, a peacekeeper is someone who just wants tranquility and everybody to get along at any cost. And usually that cost is compromise. We'll just have to leave out certain things. We'll have to avoid certain issues if we're all going to get along. And that day is fast approaching when a one world religion will have to remove for the sake of worldly peace. We'll have to remove any isolated issues that would in any way place someone in a different category. In other words, I can't judge you. We'll all just get along together and use some ambiguous term of loving one another as long as we don't hurt each other. But we can no longer say, for example, that your Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. Other radicals will be addressed, such as uh, radical Islam that says, unless you believe in Allah, then you must be destroyed. Those radical positions must be removed, and we must now compromise and find a way that we can all just get along so that we can have peace, but not the peace that only Jesus can give. So notice what he says. He said, I have come. Jesus himself said, I've come to bring in some cases necessary division. And it goes far deeper than just because one's saved and one is lost and there's a division in the family. It goes a lot deeper than that. And I want to take you there this morning. You know, in the Gospel of John, uh, actually it's in this same Gospel in chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus makes another statement that's a bit strange. He says, beware, this is in Luke 6, verse 26. Beware when all men think well of you. Let me say that again. And I'm repeating Jesus himself. He looked at his disciples and he said, beware. Watch out when all men think well of you. Now, why would he make such a statement? It would seem that he would want 
everyone to think well of us. He would want our lives to be of such a nature that uh, we would have no one that would think ill of us. And who is it among us that doesn't want everyone to like us? But you see what he's saying there, the key is in the word all. Beware when all men think well of you. The best analogy I could give you is the difference between what we have today called politicians versus old statesmen. What's the difference? A politician is someone who checks the direction of the wind and decides what they believe in that moment. A politician is someone who will address issues based on the audience that he's addressing. And it may be completely different when he's in front of a, another audience. Why? Because he wants to be thought well of by all men. Increase his polls. That's a politician. Whereas a statesman is someone who has strong convictions. In the early days of our nation, there were men who had strong biblical convictions. And they wouldn't compromise them for votes or popularity. And because of that, they had little concern that all men would think well of them. Jesus actually, right after he said, blessed are the peacemakers, that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the very next verse he says, and blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. And so he seems to have combined right there together that in fact, if you're a true peacemaker, if you're one who is going to insist that the only real peace is when we have peace with God, when you have peace with God, and therefore together and only then can we have peace together. But he said many are not going to accept that. Unless you compromise to have all men think well of you, he said then many are going to persecute you, but nonetheless you're blessed because you are walking in true peace as a peacemaker. Beware when all men think well of you. Because Jesus warned us, he said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so if you are endeavoring to have everyone like you, the danger is, and the real possibility is, that you're having to compromise somewhere along the line. When you're with this crowd, since you know they don't believe in that, and even though you do and you know it's in the Bible, I'm going to avoid that because I want to be a peacemaker. That's not a peacemaker. That's a peacekeeper. That's keeping tranquility at the cost of truth. Now stay with me because we're going to go even a little deeper here. You see, there's coming a day very soon when in fact there will be a cry for world peace such as never before. We're told in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 that some of the signs of the end were going to be increasing wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nation, ethnic wars, racial turbulence, we're told that there'd be signs and, and patterns in the weather. It'll be blamed on climate change, but Jesus already told us it's part of the judgment and warning that he's soon to come. But did you realize that the very first warning, long before the earthquakes and before the wars and the rumors of wars, when the disciples asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? His first response, which is the important one, he said, beware lest men deceive you. In other words, the first action of the enemy is to bring a great deception. Now, I believe, and if I had more time to, to this morning, I don't, I would show you throughout God's word from beginning to end that God has warned us that a day is coming, that it's going to look like great peace has come, there's going to be one who's going to orchestrate this as a world leader who will look so accomplished at his task to bring about world peace that they will call him God and he will show himself as God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10, he will sit in even the temple of God showing himself as God, bringing about a seeming world peace. A number of years ago, uh, on one of my trips to New York, uh, where I was ministering, I took a day and I had looked at a few places that I hadn't been to yet. One of them was the United Nations. And in the United Nations, there's a small meditation room wherein is a black stone, a cabal stone. What it represents is your God, whoever he may be, your religious beliefs, whatever they may be, 
that represents it. In other words, an ecumenical, uh, you call it what you want to, the God of your choice, as is popularly said today. And I happened to notice before I left that room, on the wall was a bronze plaque with the words of a speech that was given by, at that time, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Boutrous Boutrous Ghali. And in the lengthy speech he gave, the words that stood out to me, and I'm going to paraphrase, he said to the effect, he said, our world is in chaos and needs peace. Send us a deliverer, be he God or devil. Send us a deliverer, be he God or devil. And I believe that request is going to be answered and it will be the devil showing himself as God. And it's going to be great deception to the world. <clears throat> Only those who know the truth and much of what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight will have been warned and alerted and be aware of God's word that told us that there's coming a false peace in the world. You know, in the days of Jeremiah, well, let me go back to Luke 6, when Jesus said, beware that all men think well of you, actually, that's only half the verse. And then he goes on to say, and it seems a bit strange, but it's so key to understanding why he said, beware when all men think well of you. He said, for so did your fathers to the prophets of old. And what was he talking about? In this case, he's talking about their religious forefathers, Pharisees and Sadducees. And he's talking about the false prophets. And what he said was, he said, beware when all men think well of you because that's exactly what your forefathers did with the false prophets. They were well thought of by everyone. Why? Because they prophesied falsely. They said what the people wanted to hear. They avoided the truth, which was warnings that unless they lined their lives up with God's word, repented and turned back to God, the judgment was coming. Only a small handful of true prophets spoke the truth. And by the way, they were the true peacemakers because they were trying to remove the barrier between God and them and judgment to come and peace to remain. The only way to make peace was to listen to the truth and remove the barriers that now are bringing God's judgment. Jeremiah did that. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah points at these false prophets and he said, you say to the people, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They thought they were peacemakers. They were keeping the people happy. They were tickling ears and saying smooth things, as Jeremiah said. And then they turned to Jeremiah and said, and you're the problem. You're the one stirring up the people. You're the one creating conflict. We're trying to make peace while you're disturbing the people. Now, they weren't making peace. They were trying to just keep the peace and tranquility of a very carnal culture. Actually, King Ahab, and you find this in 1 Kings chapter 18, because Elijah was doing the same thing, prophesying truth, which looked like he was only causing conflict. And King Ahab turned to him and he said, you are the one who troubles all of Israel. And Elijah said, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Because you have embraced these prophets of Baal who lie to the people to keep a so-called peace. When in fact there is no peace. Matthew 24, Jesus warned there would be many false prophets and they would deceive many. And then I want to read you, and I want to read this to you directly from the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians because they are, in fact, that dramatically telling of what we're discussing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, But the times and the seasons, he said, My brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. In other words, you should know some of the things I'm talking to you about right now. The next verse, he says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the last day, 
the day of God's final judgment before he returns. You know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now listen to the words of the next verse, verse three. For when they, they who? They, the false prophets and all the so-called peace keepers. When they shall say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them. It comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. When will this happen? At a time in which the cry of the world will be, we finally have peace, peace, and safety. And yet here we're told both Old and New Testament that there was no peace, and that soon destruction was going to come because they had bought the lie that if we just watered down certain things that are irritating to individuals, separate us from them, make us prejudice, and we just all say the same thing and, and, and remove all of these issues that are so controversial, then we can all get along and we'll have world peace. But the prophets have said there will be no peace. In fact, suddenly will come destruction and there will be no safety. Again, if you take time to read from Daniel 11 all the way through Revelation chapter 6, you will see over and over again woven throughout the themes of Scripture, the warnings that in the last days there's going to be another Tower of Babel, another attempt of the enemy to bring about a world order where all bow to one God who is not a God. And he will do signs and miracles. It says he will speak great, eloquent words. I'm sure he'll come up with policies that no politician ever has. It'll seem to be successful. Wars will start to cease. Peace will suddenly, for the first time in history, take place in the Middle East. But our Bible tells it won't last very long. Because suddenly will come destruction. Even though they've cried, peace, peace. And you see, the deception is going to be that people will be getting what they want. Now, I want you to stay with me very carefully because this is ground zero for where the problems in the church are today. Instead of us from the pulpits of our land telling the people what God wants and what God's standards are, and if we follow them, we'll be blessed. We've decided to find out what the people want. It's the very formula for seeker-friendly churches to go throughout a neighborhood, go door to door and ask and fill out forms. What is it that you don't like about church? Why don't you go anymore? What would you like to see happen in church? And they took this conglomerate of ideas from people and they put together the new format that has become very popular today and built what we call mega churches with false unity and no real peace with God. Because you see, one of the things they had to remove that was very distasteful to a majority of those that were polled was that I don't like someone telling me about sin. I don't want to hear about this bloody cross. I'd rather you encourage me and give me something to have hope in and tell me that God's got a, a good plan and purpose for my life. Help me to know how I can do that. And so we have, as Paul prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have learned how to tickle ears and tell the people what they want instead of what God's word is and bring them what we call peace when in fact, when we abandon God's word, we have abandoned the only hope for true peace. And an only, only those who preach the truth can offer true peace and be peacemakers. And so there's going to be a false move by one who will call himself God. And there'll be a world peace that will take place temporarily. It'll look good. Even those who decry against it because they know God's word, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, all gospels say that that's when they, they who think they found this world peace, they're going to kill you and think they do God a service. They will think you're actually an enemy of this great God movement that has finally brought peace to the world. But the only way they can bring that peace is to compromise. 
We've got to remove John 14, 6. Jesus cannot be the only way, truth, and life. All paths will lead to God. Much will be said as is already being taught that uh, whether he goes by the name of Allah, Jehovah, Vishnu, Hindu, Buddha, it doesn't matter because it's all God. We all serve the same God. No, my friends, there are many false gods, demonic entities masquerading as gods. But there's only one true God, and he sent his only son to die for our sins. It's the only path out of destruction. It's the only path to eternal life. However, the enemy through the unholy trinity is going to create a false peace in the world. The unholy trinity that First John calls the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil will instigate the plan, the world will promote the plan, and our flesh will love the plan. And through the unholy trinity, there will be a false peace that won't last because it's built on the wrong foundation. It's built on flesh. It's built on the desires of, a, of our own fleshly needs rather than on God's word. And out of it will come great deception. So what does a true peacemaker do? Not a peacekeeper. Not one who just wants tranquility at any cost, but one who wants to see in the lives of those who are struggling today, wants to see them have true peace, wants to see peace in their own lives. The peace comes only through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Apostle Paul himself said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, he said that, he, Jesus, made peace through the blood of his cross. There's the formula for a peacemaker. Colossians 1.20 He himself, speaking of Jesus, made peace, true peace, through the blood of his cross. And yet it's that same cross that the Apostle Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, I believe it's verse 20 and 21. He said, but it's the cross that is the stumbling block to the world. It's the cross that is the barrier that keeps people from embracing and understanding the gospel. Oh, my friends, please hear me as I close. Any wonder the Apostle Paul said, that's why I've determined that I'm not going to preach anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. For that's the power of God. Without the preaching of the cross, we have no power. Listen, my friends, all the miracles that Jesus did couldn't save you and I. His great wisdom, and he had all knowledge. The great teachings of Jesus. He still couldn't save us without dying on a cross as our sacrifice for our sin. And it's only through the preaching of that freedom, that good news, that anyone can find true peace with God. If you're going to make peace in your home, it's by bringing Christ into the chaos. If you're going to find peace in your own heart, it's not by avoiding difficult situations and controversial subjects, biblical principles that perhaps your loved ones disagree with. But when you stand for truth, that is the only opportunity they have to embrace true peace. And when they do, you become a peacemaker. It's all about the cross, my friends. Any wonder the world hates the cross. The devil hates the cross. And churches more and more now have found that they can grow larger and become more popular if they avoid the cross, to avoid the talk of sin. Why avoid the cross? Because then we have to understand the reason for it. It was because a perfect sacrifice had to die for a sinful world. We don't want to consider ourselves sinners. That's no longer politically correct. I'm okay, you're okay. We're all good people. We just need a few tweaks and refinement. In a lot of churches today, that's all they'll teach you. How to tweak and refine your life to be happier. When in fact the problem is sin. 
And the only way you can have peace is by coming into peace with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. And even after we've come to Christ, the problems in your life are those barriers of sin that now again need to be removed so that you continue to walk in peace with God and have his blessing. It's all through the Bible. Do you realize if you go all the way back to the beginning, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 10, when Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, release them from this captivity of 400 years. Pharaoh, demonically driven, finally decides, yes, you can go. But I want you to note something. Did you realize when he finally said that they could go, he said, but with one stipulation, you can't take your cattle with you. Now, why did he say that? Well, the answer is in how Moses responds to him. Pharaoh says, you can go, you can take your children, you can take your possessions, but don't take, you can't take your cattle. And Moses responds and said, oh no, we're taking all of our cattle because without them, we cannot sacrifice to our God. You see, that sacrifice was a picture of the cross. Every sacrifice from the beginning of the Old Testament Every type and shadow throughout the entirety of the Bible is a picture of the cross upon which Jesus died, which is the only thing that could save you and I. What can wash away my sin? Not the wisdom of Jesus, not the teachings of Jesus, not the miracles of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Moses said no. He said, we're taking all of our cattle. King James, he said, not one hoof will be left behind. Because somehow in his spirit, he understood this is so important to God that without sacrifice, that which pictured what Christ would do one day, there is no protection for us. There is no power. There is no deliverance. There is no provision. It's only through the sacrifice. And without the animals, we cannot obey God and present to him that which is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. My friends, what does it really mean to be a peacemaker? Sometimes it means you'll be called a troublemaker. Sometimes it'll appear you're doing anything but creating an environment of peace. But if you stand for truth and avoid compromise and trust God, there is always then hope that that individual, that your family, that your friends, will find the only true way to peace through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ himself. Now, you may be going through some of that difficulty with your family. I understand it's not easy. And I understand the temptation to say, I'm not even going to talk about it again. I don't want to bring it up. My friends, it's time to stand strong for Jesus. When we think of the apostles of old and the martyrs who were willing to stand for Jesus even at the cost of their own life, because they had made peace with God. And they were offering, if not only by words, but by the very demonstration of their sacrificial life, they were offering to others the only way of peace. They were peacemakers, not peacekeepers. And my friends, if you want to see peace in your own heart, it's not by listening to someone who'll just make you feel good to go to another religious pep rally, to come out pumped up only to realize there's still a darkness and a depression in your soul that can only be removed when you find that surrender to the peace maker, the one who made peace for you and I on the cross. He's called the Prince of Peace. And he's the only one that can bring that peace in your heart and life. Heavenly Father, I pray for those today that are without peace and perhaps they're living in a chaotic home and with a chaotic life and a heart that's full of depression. And Father, I pray today these words will stir them to know that the very thing they think will bring greater turmoil will bring peace. When they take that stand and say, I am going to follow Jesus, the cross before me, the world behind me, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I pray, Father, that that peace that passes all understanding, will fill their heart even today, yes, even now. 
They'll understand what it really means to be a peacemaker. God bless you. It's not easy. It wasn't for Jesus. He said they hated me. They'll probably hate you. But one day we'll stand before him and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were a peacemaker. God bless.